session. It is scheduled to last about one hour and 15 minutes. We have reserved some time towards the end of the webinar for Q&A session as well. Please submit your questions in the Q&A module, not in the regular chat box. While posting your questions, please kindly state your name and organization or institution. We will try to accommodate as many requests as possible, either in writing or orally during the webinar. If you have any problems or technical issues, please send a message in the chat box to ask for support. That's all for housekeeping issues. Now, I would like to take a moment to give a brief background information on FAO in Geneva Agriculture Trade Talks. As you will already know, FAO supports its members' efforts to formulate trade policies that are conducive to improve food security by strengthening evidence and analysis, providing capacity development, and facilitating a neutral dialogue away from the negotiating table. In this spirit, we have been organizing FAO in Geneva Agricultural Trade Talks in collaboration with the Marcus and Trade Division with a view to share information on relevant and timely topics at the intersection of trade and agriculture. These trade talks are based on an approach that we call the three I's. Informal, which refers to exchanging information, ideas, and views without any attributions and reporting. Interactive, which refers to providing a neutral platform for dialogue and engagement among stakeholders, and inspirational, which refers to sharing knowledge and ideas for use in policy and negotiations accordingly. Excellencies, distinguished delegates and participants, let me now briefly present today's topic. As we are all aware, the world is facing multifaceted challenges which have been negatively affecting food security situation globally. In particular, those challenges are posing significant difficulties for the most vulnerable countries and populations in the world. For example, the recent rises and volatilities in the price of food, agricultural inputs, especially fertilizers, and energy has significantly affected import-dependent countries. These challenges and risks highlighted the need to consider import-related vulnerabilities concerning food security. With this as background, FAO is currently working on an empirical approach to capture dependency on imported food and associated risk factors from the perspective of an importing country. And today, FAO will present this approach in the context of the Near East and North Africa, a region that is overall highly dependent on imported food and that may therefore be especially exposed to shocks affecting key global suppliers of food commodities. To this end, we have Mr. Jakob Roschandorfer from FAO with us today. He is an economist in the trade policy team of FAO's markets and trade division. After his presentation, the following speakers will share with us their insights on the topic. Dr. Ahmed Diab from the Permanent Mission of Egypt to the World Trade Organization. Mr. Ahmed Mukhtar from FAO's Regional Office for Near East and North Africa. Mr. Kibrum Bey from International Food Policy Research Institute. We will now hear more from Jakob about the empirical approach I have just mentioned. As I indicated earlier, please post any questions in the Q&A module. Your questions will be answered by the presenter and panelists during the session or at the end of our meeting, time permitting. Please, Jakob, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, so this should work. Um, well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I would like to just briefly extend my thanks uh, to the colleagues in Geneva to organize this session and to other panelists uh, for taking the time to attend uh, and to discuss a topic that I think is of uh, great importance for a large number of countries. So the title of my presentation today is uh, Food Imports, Food Security and Vulnerability, Empirical Indicators with an Implication to the Near East and North Africa Reason region and I should just highlight that this is very much um, a work in progress that is currently under review but that will hope so hopefully also become public facing in the form of a technical note in, in due time. So the main goal or the purpose um, of this work is to provide a data informed or data driven approach uh, to assessing how vulnerable or exposed a country's food supplies are to shocks affecting its imports. So. What we would like to understand is how critical imports are for food supply in a country, 
and also to be able to identify associated risk factors that could potentially also be addressed by public policy measures or reform. And in line with this, this goal, this work, and also today's presentation is structured around four key guiding questions that provide a bit of a framework on how to think about these import-related vulnerabilities. Uh, so starting from a very basic questions, how important are imports uh, for a country's food security, but also the diversity of its food supply? We'll then talk about how diversified our country's global sourcing relationships. So how many trading partners are they? How important are each of them? We'll then talk a little bit about whether we can say something about how stable are the supplies that come from a country's trading partners. And number four, in case shocks occur, how easily can a country or its traders switch to alternative source countries? And what I will attempt to do here today is to provide a data-driven or empirical answers to each of these four questions in the form of cross-country comparable indicators for those countries that we refer to as the Near East and North Africa region. I sometimes also refer to the Netherlands just as an outside of region or global benchmark. Um, just before proceeding, I want to just make a few contextualizing comments on this. So first, and I think this is something that will become quite apparent throughout this talk, is that when assessing whether or not we would want to think, or we should think of a country as exposed to shocks affecting its import, jointly considering answers to each of these questions is important. <clears throat> Uh, for example, we may find that a country is highly dependent on food imports, but that at the same time, these imports come from a very wide range of different trading partners that have been very reliable in, um, in, in, in supplying to global markets in the past. Second, to facilitate cross-country comparison, in this presentation, I will usually speak of aggregate food uh, converted into calories rather than of individual commodities. And last, and just to mention this, this presentation is really mostly concerned with discussing results. Uh, rather than data and empirical methods. So with these comments um, as background, let us now proceed to the first question in this framework. And that is how important are imports for countries' food security and the diversity of its food supply? And the intuition here is that in the context of vulnerability, everything else being equal, being more reliant on sourcing food from global markets would render an importing country more exposed to either global price swings or trading partner or trade route uh, specific shocks. And so to answer this question, I want to introduce the first central indicator in this framework, which will come up um, quite a bit, which is the so-called import dependency ratio. Now, the import dependency ratio tells us the share of the total domestic availability of calories that is sourced through imports. So for example, um, considering Egypt on the slide, roughly 40% of calories that are available domestically are sourced through imports on average. Um, a value of one here would mean that a ca all calories that are available in a country are sourced for imports, while a negative value would mean that a country is a net exporter of calories, so with exports exceeding imports. So I promised um, little information about data and methods, but there's one methodological point that I need to make here. It's really important to keep in mind that not all commodities that are imported or domestically produced will also end up as food for human consumption. So, for example, wheat as a as a major food commodity is also often used as uh, for other purposes, such as feed for animals, in many countries, including in the Nina region, according to the data. Um, in terms of key messages that I think we should take from this graph, I think there are two. First, um, all countries in the Nina region are net imports of calories, as indicated by positive values for the import dependency ratio. And the second key message is that being a net import of calories is not necessarily um, unusual. So the Netherlands, as a, as a, as a global out or outside of region point of comparison, is also a net import of calories. And so are, in fact, many other countries such as uh, the UK or Italy. For a brief excursion, Beyond the role of imports in the um, aggregate supply of calories, we can also take a different angle. So we could, for example, ask whether imports matter for the diversity of a country's domestic food supply and are thereby conducive or maybe even essential uh, for the goal of fostering more diversified um, or healthier diets. And so this is a notion uh, explored on this current graph. Um, first, the bars show us the number of different individual food items um, that are available in a country according to FAO supply utilization account data. Um, in dark blue are those items which are either domestically produced or imported, while in gold, 
we see those items that are only available domestically because they're imported. So for example, in the case of the United Arab Emirates, we see that only about 50 individual food products are produced domestically with the country managing to significantly um, expand the variety of available food items through the import channel. Um, a second point that I want to make on the slide is that the golden circles here indicate how diversified food supply in a country is overall. And lower values here mean um, more diversification. Um, the Netherlands is scoring really well in this regard, um, while a distinct pattern across the NINA region is that overall food supply is relatively undiversified with a large role for wheat derived products in particular. So the key message in summary from this slide is that imports may not only matter for the overall supply of calories, um, they may also play um, an important role in enhancing the diversity of domestic food supply and may um, thereby be very important for um, more diversified diets. Okay, so considering again aggregate food supply and turning to the second question of this framework, being a net importer of calories may not necessarily mean that a country is exposed um, to import related shocks. So for example, if the importer sources food from a wide range of different source countries, shocks that affect exports from one individual supplier may not be that problematic. And this leads us to the second um, sort of like natural question in this framework. If a country depends on food imports for domestic availability, how diversified are its global relation uh, sourcing relationships? And in this graph, we consider exactly that. We jointly look at import dependency for calories combined with information on how diversified a country's global sourcing relationships are. Um, so on the y-axis, we see exactly the same indicators presented previously, the import dependency ratio. Again, higher values indicate higher dependency on imports overall. And on the y-axis, -x -x this information is now complemented complemented with information on how diversified a country's global sourcing relationships are. And in, in short, like higher values on the x-axis indicate that a country's import relationships are less diversified and more concentrated on uh, perhaps a few important source countries. Last, um, as complementing information on the current state of food security in the country, the size of the circle is proportional to the share of a country's population that has been estimated to be undernourished. So for example, in Jordan, uh, which has the largest circle in this graph, the prevalence of undernourishment in the population was estimated to be around 16.9% um, uh, in the recent State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World uh, Report. And so when we combine this information, we could say that countries that have bigger circle sizes and that are more towards the upper right corner of this graph could be considered as more exposed to shocks in supplier countries that affect their participation. Um, and export markets. Expanding on these um, aggregate results, I thought it would be it would be prudent to briefly highlight that this type of analysis capturing source country concentration can of course also be conducted uh, for individual commodities of interest. So for example, in both Egypt and uh, Morocco, the two countries that are on the slide here, wheat derived products are prominent in food supply. And at the same time, both countries are substantial net importers of wheat. And um, on the top slide here, we see the share of individual supplier countries in Morocco's total imports of wheat in 2021. Uh, we also see that the top three suppliers accounted for circa 65% of total wheat grain imports. Um, however, in addition to that, there were active trading relationships with some more source countries. The bottom figure shows the same data for Egypt. And here, the three top supplier countries accounted for roughly 87% of total imports of wheat grain in 2021, and there were only fewer additional trading relationships with other additional countries. Now, let me briefly make two important comments on these findings on these, uh, on these data. So first and foremost, I think it's critical to highlight that governments usually do not directly import grains or other food commodities themselves. However, they may shape the decisions that importers or traders make through economic and, and or trade policy. And expanding on this, in the context of the NINA region, many governments actually make international purchases by issuing public tenders for grains. However, these tenders are then bidded for and fulfilled by, by grain traders that observe tender criteria specified by governments. And in these cases, government policy, policy that defines the criteria for these uh, tenders may affect import pattern, which is a point that I, that I hope we'll return to at the end of 
this presentation. The second point that I just want to make here is that is, is one about trade-offs or the cost of diversification. So specifically wheat from France or Canada, which as you can see in the slide, are the two prominent source countries for Morocco, is more expensive than wheat origin, for example, from the Ukraine or Russian Federation. So while Morocco may show more diversified sourcing relationships here, that this does come at a certain um, monetary cost. Um, turning to the third question in this framework, again, for intuition, being a sizable net importer of food and sourcing only from very few suppliers may also not necessarily be an issue or risk from a vulnerability point of view. So for example, we could um, have evidence that the countries that supply to the importer have been very consistent, consistent in participating in global markets in the past, which may lead us to infer something also about their future participation and behavior. And so taking this idea to the data, on this slide, we see how diversified a country's relationships are on the y-axis. This is exactly the same data as presented previously, um, with higher values meaning less diversification. Um, the circle size expresses dependency on imports for domestic availability. And the new element shown here on the x-axis is an indicator that captures or that expresses how consistent the individual countries that make up the supplier network of an individual NENA country have been in exporting food to global markets over the past 25 years. So higher values on the x-axis mean that a country sources significantly uh, from countries that have been sort of like less consistent or less stable in supplying to global markets in the past. And so to elaborate on the results with one intuitive example, I believe, is the Netherlands, here shown in dark blue, is a country that sources mostly, if not only, from countries like France, Germany, or Belgium that have shown a very high degree of consistency in exporting in the past. That is also true if to a lesser extent, uh, for example, for Morocco, for which I will show just another slide in just a moment. While, for example, um, countries like, uh, like Libya is a country that sources a lot of its food imports from countries that have in the past, according to the data that we have, been somewhat less consistent in supply into global markets, which could be due to a variety of reasons such as crop failure or um, government policy um, aimed at curbing exports for, with the you know, reasonable intention of securing supplies uh, domestically. As just mentioned, I thought it could be helpful to briefly just zoom into one of the individual NINA countries and look at the case of a single commodity for this type of analysis. So on this slide, we see a case that I presented previously already, um, Morocco's wheat imports in, in 2021. Um, on the left axis, we see the shares held by individual suppliers in Morocco's imports of this commodity, while on the right side, on the right axis, we see the indicator that captures how consistent individual suppliers have been in supplying wheat grain to global markets in the past. And so I believe the key insight here is that also partly explains the overall result for Morocco that we saw on the previous slide, is that France and Canada, from which Morocco sourced around 45% of its wheat imports in 2021, have shown a very consistent participation in global export markets in the past, and more consistent so than other key global suppliers of the same commodity. So just as an example, um, India, which is here on the far right, um, which did account um, for roughly 4% of globally exported wheat in 2021, making it an important um, player in that year, has shown more variable export participation in global wheat exports over the past, um, past two and a half decades. Um, the final slide on this third question um, illustrates that we can also consider individual or country level factors that may affect how consistently a country's exporters can partake in global markets. Um, and so this might be, for example, factors like the frequency um, of unusual climatic events, such as droughts or other catastrophes, but also government policy that may be aimed at restricting export participation of a country's traders, such as <clears throat> For example, bans as considered in this slide. And so just as one example, um, on this slide, I'm showing a constructed indicator on the x-axis that captures a sort of like revealed tendency of the countries in an important country's supplier network to use bans uh, on important food items. And so again, uh, key and uh, I think intuitive result here is that the Netherlands, again, as an you know global benchmark or outside of region uh, comparison country, as a country that sources mostly uh, from other 
suppliers that do not have a recent history of using export restrictions is less at risk um, of having to cope with interruptions in supplier relationships um, caused uh, by such uh, government policy and uh, by its partners. So reaching the fourth and already the last question in this framework, we might also want to ask the following in the context of uh, import related vulnerabilities. So how easily can a country switch to alternative sources in the case of shocks affecting current suppliers? And um, the intuition here is that sourcing only from a very small number of supplier countries could again be considered less problematic from the perspective of vulnerability if traders in the importing country can easily switch to other source countries. And so for this work, this ability to switch to alternative suppliers in the case of shocks is broken down into two broad components. First is the question, well, what would it actually cost to switch to other source countries? And here it seems that there are different cost dimensions that should be considered when thinking about how costly it could be to switch from our current suppliers to alternative ones. Specifically, alternative suppliers may be further away in geographical terms than current ones. They may be more expensive to trade with, so there could be uh, policy barriers, barriers or even things like language. And thirdly, their products could be more expensive. So for example, again, in the context of wheat, Ukrainian wheat, for example, is traded at lower prices than wheat originating from the, uh, from the United States or from France. And just to illustrate the relevance of these ideas, with an intuitive and real life example. At the beginning of um, the war in Ukraine, Egypt, like many other countries, faced the challenge of replacing wheat imports from Ukraine. And um, back then, it was considered to source from India. And in this context, again, just for intuition, it's, for example, noteworthy that the nautical distance or the shipping distance between Egypt's port of Said and Mumbai is around twice the distance between the port of Said and Odessa in Ukraine. So just as an example, in this context, replacing imports from one source with imports from an alternative one would have come at a, amongst others, at a, at a cost in the form of um, higher shipping expenses. Um, in the indicators developed in this framework that we're working on, these different types of costs that might be associated with switching suppliers are expressed in the form of metrics at the level of the importer. And so the slide on the right side here only shows one example for these, an, an overall cost of switching indicator for aggregate food um, on the x-axis. Values further on the right indicate higher trade costs associated with switching suppliers. And the key results here are that first, in terms of agricultural trade costs, it would be more expensive for most NENA countries to switch suppliers compared to the Netherlands. Um, and additionally, NENA countries that face higher cost of switching tend to um, tend to have uh, less diversified uh, sourcing relationships. The second question that I just quickly want to touch upon is the question about the country's financial ability to cope with higher cost of food imports. And a key issue for net food importing countries in this context seems to be whether there are sufficient foreign exchange earnings in convertible currencies, so USD or Euro, to pay for imported commodities. And so again, just for intuition, a rich oil exporting country may have less difficulties in coping with rising food import bills. So in the context of thinking about or identifying vulnerabilities, one issue we should probably consider in a country assessment is the relationship between the value of a country's food and other essential non-food imports um, on the one side and the size of its foreign exchange earnings generated, for example, for merchandise exports, but also for other sources of external finance, such as remittances or through um, services exports like, like inbound tourism. I would like to, like to close with just a few ideas on how to potentially reduce food import related vulnerabilities in, in NENA countries. And I would hope that we can pick upon some of these later on when we have a discussion. First, I think a relatively distinct future of many NENA countries is that governments themselves are often very much involved in purchasing food commodities internationally, especially grains. So for example, in the case of Egypt, data for 2021 would suggest that the uh, General Authority for Supply Commodities, uh, which is, um, in my understanding, Egypt's main body for purchasing wheat internationally, accounted for around 40% of the country's total wheat imports in 2021, uh, through its um, tender program. And so one opportunity to reduce the cost of imported food and reduce vulnerabilities in the short to medium run 
would be to consider the specifications put forward in such public tenders, for example, with respect to quality requirements or terms of del delivery. In a similar vein, um, exploring um, options to leverage uh, private sector participation may also help reducing risks, for example, by getting more agents or more traders involved in importing activities. Second, I think where possible, um, exploring options to produce increased quantities domestically in a sustainable manner would be important. So as a very water scarce region, it would, for example, be prudent, I believe, to consider more efficient irrigation schemes such as drop versus surface irrigation. And third, reducing food waste as well as losses along supply chains could improve over avail availability and thereby may have a mediating effect on prices. And finally, I think in the more long run, um, promoting more diversified diets, for example, through educational campaigns or by reviewing the structure of existing subsidy programs could not only more promote more diversified and healthier diets, but may also help in reducing import related vulnerabilities. For example, by increasing demand for products that have a different um, global production pattern um, than wheat. And with this, I'd like to share. Um, like to like to like to like to stop um, and close. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'd pass back to the moderator. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jakob, uh, for this comprehensive presentation on the approach, which has been framed around four questions you mentioned that are of relevance in the context of food import, food security, and vulnerability, and as well as for your points on how to address food imported vulnerabilities. We will now hear from Dr. Ahmed Diab. Mr. Diab is the Minister Plenipotentiary at the Permanent Mission of Egypt to the World Trade Organization. He is the head of the Economic and Commercial Office and Chief Trade Negotiator in the mission. Mr. Diab will share with us his view from a government perspective on imported, import related vulnerabilities and on how to improve resilience to shocks affecting imports. Please, Mr. Diab, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me to this very important uh, gathering and be, to be one of the uh, uh, speakers. Actually, uh, I'll listen to what Jacob had to say and definitely uh, what he uh, mentioned or uh, the presentation that he provided is actually uh, um, uh, very uh, informative in terms of providing all uh, kind of information uh, relevant to the situation of net food importing developing countries and LDCs, and especially in the, in the MENA region, North Africa in specific. Um, um, first, let, let, let's uh, let's all agree that uh, trade is very important, and um, uh, to contributing uh, its contribution to feeding the world is very uh, important, and no one can deny the importance of trade and its contribution to feeding the world. Um, some figures, actually, international trade in food and agriculture products um, increased from five hundred billion dollars in two thousand and one to reach over one billion six hundred and ten billion dollars in twenty twenty. Um, uh, the growth uh, in trade related, uh, I mean, in, in global trade in value uh, has been fastest in, in some products, uh, specific products actually, um, all, like oil seeds, fruits, vegetables, meat, and fish. And this uh, indicates that um, uh, global, I mean, uh, food security, uh, those products which constitute the, maybe the uh, main uh, dietary uh, ingredients uh, when it comes to food security in our countries are very important and global trade is increasing. So global trade in those products are very important. And of course, they uh, will have their uh, significant contribution to uh, our food security. Um, however, uh, let me ag again share with you the uh, fact that in a number of net food importing developing countries and less least developed countries, food imports have been rising for various reasons. Uh, part of which uh, would be attributed to rapid rapid population growth and um, uh, in other uh, countries could be attributed to um, a slow growth of domestic food production. Uh, in some countries, uh, I mean, the reason uh, could be, I mean, um, uh, attributed to both reasons uh, or to both, uh, both, uh, both, both dimensions, increase in population as well as decrease or slow growth of domestic food production. This is a, an important dimension that we have to consider when we uh, get to talk about the strategies we have to employ when it comes to trade and, 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 and its relation to food security. Again, for net food importing developing countries, imports are of crucial, crucial importance. The level of, of imports and its ratio in the importing countries' food security basket, uh, we believe should be based on an economic model that would provide insight into the uh, principal structural relationship 
that would underlie the determination of food imports and uh, their contribution in uh, the country's aggregate food system and food security strategies. Um, so um, having said so, allow me to share with you, I mean, uh, how we think when it comes to um, uh, developing or putting together the, this economic model uh, and the variables that this model should include in order for us to define how important is um, uh, food imports in uh, our strategy, in our aggregate strategy when it comes to food security. Um, and we have counted like maybe uh, seven or eight uh, uh, variables or components of this model. First of all, uh, as alluded to earlier by Jacob in his presentation, the percentage or the proportion uh, of food imports uh, with respect to the total food, uh, total import uh, expenditures. Uh, of course, this shall have its ramifications and implications on other imports. Uh, if we, uh, you, you, um, you allocate a um, big part of your scarce uh, foreign reserve of foreign currency to buying food from abroad uh, or importing food for, I mean, food security purposes, then this will come at the toll of finance um, other imports, which are equally important when it comes to uh, global, um, um, up to our I mean, uh, uh, policy uh, objectives that are uh, to pursue like development, other development objects, uh, objectives like industrialization and so on and so forth. And I will give you an example. Um, um, in Egypt, for example, we have um, um, $89 billion worth of imports out of which 25 to 28 billion, this is an est estimate for this year, are expected to be spent on food imports and other agriculture, uh, strategic agriculture and food products, mainly wheat, vegetable oils, corn, sugar, meat. Uh, this is about 28 to 30% um, of our aggregate import bill. Um, I think Jacob, Jacob referred to this earlier as the important country's financial ability. Uh, the second uh, part or the second um, item or variable that we should consider when we get to maybe put together this economic model to determine the level of imports and their significance has to do with the, um, with the idea again that was explained uh, earlier by Jacob that most of um, our food imports are almost universally um, done under the control of a state authority. Um, the Ministry of Supply and Internal Trade for, from Egypt actually is taking care of this. Uh, Forty percent, as alluded to by Jacob earlier, uh, of our imports um, of wheat, um, of our wheat imports, uh, are purchased uh, via this uh, or through this um, authority, the uh, General Authority for Supply Commodities. Um, even though they do that at uh, market prices, so again, um, the level of imports uh, have to be related to the government policies um, that we uh, employed with respect to purchasing food from abroad. Um, and we, is the case that um, we um, actually um, um, definitely, um, which is very important, that's why we have to source it through this uh, organization. The third variable has to do with the food imports um, that are being provided under concessionary terms, like food aid, for example. Um, of course, food aid might come at uh, the account of local production, and this could put local production at risk, putting farmers at risk, farmers' is incomes, at risk, incomes at risk, and of course, this has its own ramifications and implications on, of course, the internal context uh, 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 as far as food security is concerned. However, in the case of Egypt, food aid is minimal and related to certain sectors and activities, so we don't count really on food aid as a source of, uh, I mean, to address our food security concerns. The fourth dimension uh, that we have to take in, on board when we get to uh, when we talk about this economic model has to do with decisions on the internal pricing of food crops to both producers and consumers because this is likely to reflect the possibilities for substitution in both i mean uh, production and consumption uh, wheat is um, actually given a very high priority it's, it ranks high uh, um, on, on the ladder of priorities following the food crisis that we are facing nowadays and due as well to the importance of wheat in, in our dietary regime and uh, intake the fifth element uh, has to do with economic and geopolitical conditions in trading partners which are of significant importance um, 77 percent of egypt's wheat is imported from um, ukraine and russia uh, supply shocks, uh, supply chain shocks and bottlenecks that emerged, emerged after the crisis, er, this crisis or the conflict erupted showed that the concentration of imports, this import destination is a challenge that we have to deal with. Now Egypt has diversified. We have made a strategic decision to diversify our sources. India was included to the list of, uh, of, of country of origin from where we can uh, uh, import uh, wheat. 
The uh, uh, variable number six is the degree of economic integration and openness to trade in both importing and exporting countries. Egypt is very open to trade. We don't have, I mean, we have, we, we, we don't have measures to uh, restrict exports or imports uh, that uh, could go beyond, I mean, emergency situations. Um, we um, uh, deployed uh, export restrictions uh, after COVID-19 and for a limited number of products, then we had to um, uh, evade them. We had, we had to stop them because we found that they are not helpful or they might not be helpful. They have been helpful for the time they were deployed, um, after which uh, we decided to maybe revert courses, uh, shift gears and uh, open the market again. The other variable, uh, variable number seven, is the degree of consistency, and this is very well, very well explained by Jacob in this presentation. The degree of consistency and concentration uh, versus diversification of the supplier, uh, and the ability, of course, to switch to other sources, uh, source countries. Um, the challenges are enormous: currency challenges, language challenges, shipping challenges, and uh, definitely uh, this is something that we take in consideration when we get to design the economic model uh, and factor in the, um, I mean, uh, trade or uh, imports as a, um, a pillar uh, uh, or uh, uh, to uh, in, in our food, food security strategy. Then health related challenges. The pandemic has revealed a lot of challenges that we were, uh, we had to, to deal with. Um, I mentioned something about export restrictions that we have, we had to apply at a certain point in time with respect to certain products. But again, uh, there will there are lessons learned from the pandemic uh, that I believe uh, should be taken into account when we get to design our future uh, food uh, system, uh, uh, food strategies, and, and food, uh, food security strategies. Uh, actually, uh, those structural relations um, between uh, the variables should be able to describe how food imports are determined and how their significance in a country's food security strategy uh, and related policies, especially in the most vulnerable and sensitive countries to food insecurity problems like. Uh, uh, countries in the MENA region. Um, and um, just to give you, I will share some, some, some figures here uh, to uh, show how the significance of the challenge we are facing uh, in the MENA region, maybe in Africa in general and in Egypt in specific. Uh, today, uh, despite the fact that between 20 and uh, 2000 and 2016, low and middle income countries share uh, of uh, world exports, agriculture exports increased from 29% to 39%. And their share of imports increased from 21% to 32%. But we can still see a pattern where net food importing developing countries and LDCs as a group are increasingly dependent on food uh, imports. Over the past decade, for example, their combined annual re um, um, imports of agriculture and food products uh, have uh, increased more than five folds from $8.7 billion in 2000 up to $55 billion in 2021. LDC's joint agriculture, at least, least, at least developed countries' joint agriculture trade deficit has substantially increased to exceed $29 billion. Um, the second fact is that um, Africa, um, as a continent, the continent of Africa, imported about 85% of uh, its food from outside the continent in 2018. This amount is uh, expected to uh, reach uh, $110 billion in 2025. Uh, cereal prices have increased, uh, maybe doubled uh, over the last uh, couple of years. Um, Self-sufficiency ratios for the various agriculture products um, um, exhibit an important, uh, I mean, the importance of imports for food security for, of a country. For example, in the case of Egypt, for example, um, I would give you some figures. When it comes to wheat, our self-sufficiency ratio is 44%. Maize, 56%, red meat, 52%, beans and legumes, 40%, oils, 5%, feed, 25 to 30%. So this means that during the period 2017 to 2021, Egypt's imports of wheat came from two major, uh, as we mentioned, uh, from two major exporters, uh, Russian Federation and Ukraine, uh, which both constituted about 77% of our wheat imports. 85% uh, of the maize imports came from Argentina, Brazil, and Ukraine. 84% of Egypt's imports of sunflowers uh, originated in Russia and uh, Ukraine. 92% uh, of Egypt's imports of frozen meat uh, 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 of, of bovine animal came from India and Brazil. So um, uh, 
but, but then we, we, we have to really uh, put uh, again um, on the table the idea of what will happen if prices increase. Uh, we found out studies, of course, found out the, uh, carried out in, in, in different in different um, in, in different um, uh, organizations, maybe in Egypt as well. Found out that changes in wheat wheat prices um, have important implications, widespread effects in Egypt. It was estimated that a ten percent increase in wheat prices would lead to a five percent increase in consumer prices. So now we can do like the calculations and see that. Um, see the implications of a uh, the price when they increase from $230 to $480 and the implications this should have on, on consumers. Um, uh, now, uh, I believe it's clear that, um, uh, having said so, I mean, and, 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 the, and, and gave you this, the, shared with you this, those figures, uh, it's clear that agriculture trade is um, of significant importance to Egypt. Uh, but trade in itself, this is the, uh, the fact that we, uh, or the lesson, lesson learned, um, is that trade by itself does not automatically enhance food security. Um, and uh, basically for a country like Egypt, which is um, a large, uh, a very big importer of wheat, for example, which uh, is a very important uh, component of our dietary uh, intake. Um, so we had to think of maybe, uh, other options to diversify our sources, to maybe rely basically on increasing our uh, local production, um, diversifying sources, expanding, uh, uh, enhancing productivity, all sorts of things that would help us address our food security challenges. Um, and we found out that those challenges necessitated that, um, I mean, this does a diversification of supply as an additional policy to reduce risk for, to food security. And we found out that this, as I mentioned, shall include the diversification of production and market resilience. It, um, it requires structural transformation in the supply side through targeted investments in uh, certain uh, in, in market infrastructure, for example, and in human capital, together with government intervention to reduce institutional deficiencies, such as lack of information, um, employing um, uh, uh, new technologies, uh, maybe working with international partners and uh, uh, trade partners to uh, uh, to 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 uh, uh, get the maybe what we call the capacity building need address our capacity building needs trade needs training uh, transfer of knowledge needs to address I mean this kind of like uh, deficiencies that we have in the market, but we were mindful of the fact that when we get to design our design our food security model we need to design this and take into account the non-market considerations of the importing country uh, uh, concerned. Uh, this has to do, of course, with uh, subsistence farmers. Um, this has to do, of course, with the uh, level of income of uh, uh, farmers, the uh, income of consumers, and of course, the allocation of this income among uh, uh, different uh, goods, um, maybe, um, uh, food uh, in specific uh, and 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 their uh, and, and and food security when it comes to individual and to household together. So um, I, I would say that for us to diversify our sources, uh, we thought as well of maybe the dimension of strengthening our regional trade relations. Um, we are negotiating. We have been uh, successfully negotiating. Um, I mean, agreements with um, I mean our trade partners in the region, the Arab world, to, and the Africans. Um, and focusing on the regional trade, we are actually uh, putting um, our weight on the um, African uh, free uh, continental uh, free area, the, the, the great African free uh, trade area, continental free trade area, and it actually shall provide opportunities for the members, its members, 54 members, to become more interdependent to address their uh, food security challenges. Another strategy is to diversify our food supply and resilience to external food market shocks is to strengthen the competitiveness of our domestic agriculture and food sector by increasing production and enhancing local productivity, as I told you before, as I mentioned before. Higher productivity actually would increase um, farmers' incomes and provide food at lower prices to consumers. Uh, the governments, um, our, my government is acting um, to attract investments that would bring new production technologies into those, uh, uh, I mean, in, in, in certain sectors, in, in certain areas, and of course, um, in, in a manner consistent with our food security strategy. Uh, it's imperative to ensure that competition um, in the agricultural market is very important. And the degree of such competition would determine the possibility of smallholder subsistence farmers to participate in global value chain markets. As, um, 
more important, and this actually is, is an area where uh, we uh, Mr. are- Mr. Diab, sorry, I am, I am interrupting you. Would it, would it be possible for you to wrap up? Uh, sure, yeah, I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to finish. Okay, thank, I, thank I, you so much. Yeah. I'm just what I want to say that when it comes to SPS, for example, measures and trade facilitative measures, we are working hard with our trade partners in, uh, uh, in that front as well. Um, um, for uh, we, our trade partners are very reliable, um, um, but the, re the re reliability, reliability depends on the global situation as the, fact the factors that I mentioned earlier uh, on in, in, my, in, my, in my intervention. Um, so I'm not going to, to, to talk about this part, I'm going to skip it because as I, I actually referred alluded to this uh, uh, earlier. Um, now with respect to the question um, uh, regarding how easy can a country switch to alternative sources in the case of shocks affecting current suppliers. Uh, we believe that in the case of shocks affecting current suppliers, it is not easy to switch to alternative sources, uh, noting that the importation of agricultural goods is in many cases subject to the assessment of technical and sanitary phytosanitary conditions in the exporting country itself. So such an assessment is important to avoid the introduction of uh, certain diseases Pests, in addition to the, uh, I mean, in addition to taking into account the logistical constraints of the importing country, in this case Egypt, of course, um, uh, uh, where we uh, actually we have in, in the case of Egypt, um, I would say that we have currently we, have, we currently have twenty two approved origins of wheat uh, after the outbreak of the uh, Ukraine war, war uh, the war in Ukraine. Egypt added only one new origin, that is India, to the list. It is noteworthy that it is just before the outbreak of the uh, uh, of the of the war that uh, uh, we um, uh, were very limited in terms of origins of wheat suppliers. Uh, furthermore, and finally, this is the very last thing I'm going to say. I would say that prices and transportation costs costs are out of major importance, and they are a determinant factor which would uh, really uh, hinder or open our abilities wider uh, when it comes to diversifying our sources. I'll stop here, and I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Diop, for these pertinent insights and for addressing the questions uh, Jakob mentioned in, in his presentation from a government perspective. Now uh, we are going to listen Mr. Ahmad Mukhtar. Uh, Ahmad Mukhtar is working as a senior economist and leading the strategy and policy team at FAO's regional office for Near East and North Africa based in Cairo, Egypt. He will provide us with some remarks on import-related vulnerabilities and on, on how to improve resilience to shocks uh, affecting imports. Please, Ahmad, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Benar, and a very good afternoon. It's good to be back to my, let's say, previous home. Um, and this series that was started. I will be very brief because uh, a lot has been said by Jacob and uh, Ambassador Dea. So I'll just build on these points. Now we know that there is a vulnerability in our region that's established. What are the solutions? There are two types of solutions that people could see. The self-sufficiency, which unfortunately a lot of people are still trying to do. And second is the trade in a way. Now, self-sufficiency, we know that there is a limitation. There is certain resource endowments that you have to be cognizant of, and we cannot go beyond that. Although there are still some productivity improvement margins in some of the countries, and in that, if we adopt a regional solution, food security, we still have some pockets that could be potential suppliers. But when it comes to trade, I want to distinguish that most of the times what we have seen is that it is not exactly a trade solution, it is a finance solution that countries apply to mitigate this vulnerability. Finance solution means if it is expensive, I'll buy from the other market uh, or other suppliers. And you know, even if it is a bit more expensive, I can subsidize and we will go on. Now, point is that are we using the trade potential in a way that is an ideal? For example, we have uh, sources that have more resilience we have sources that are closer. We have sources where we have the harmonization. Uh, as Ambassador Diab just said, I mean, in case of, let's say, Egypt or some of the other countries, uh, it is not easy to establish uh, for a new country to be a source of supply. I mean, look at the requirements that we have uh, at, at the time of imports. Uh, recently, you know, work done by our investment center and the trade division showed the huge diversity or difference in the procedures that we adopt at the time of importation and that in itself, I don't want to call it NTM, but of course, it's one of the challenges that we are facing. Um, 
even you know the gluten requirements have six types of uh, uh, criteria in our region. Now, so the point is that are we using trade intelligently? And in that in particular, are we using the potential of intra-regional trade, which is unfortunately not uh, true. Uh, are we thinking about having a regional trade solution? That is also something that we still need to work on. There are interestingly quite a number of regional, uh, let's say platforms, the League of Arab States, the uh, Arab uh, Organization for Agriculture Development, we at FAO and at different UN agencies are also supporting ESCO, for example, uh, but the results somehow are not, um, let's say, optimal for the time being. So what could be done, let's say, uh, we, we have already heard a lot, so not much for me to say, but first is, of course, the diverse, uh, diversification of the import sources that have been said by the both speakers. Ambassador, the upside, it is not easy. Agreed, sir, that is very true, but we have to do that, I think. This recent shock had uh, shown us. In case of Egypt, you are probably better off because you have the biggest wheat importer, you have no established sources. But look at Lebanon, for example. Did they have options to exercise uh, after this crisis or no? Some other country. So when we talk about region, we are really vulnerable from that perspective. So we have to diversify. Then, you know, harnessing this regional uh, potential by, by that, I think somehow we have to start thinking about establishing a regional food security approach where we think what could be done within the region, where we think about these strategic reserves and these type of things, which happens, uh, in, in, well, not really that ideally, but ASEAN uh, rice mechanism gives us one of the example. GCC is uh, trying to do a lot on that. Um, and then, you know, uh, moving on to the next one, which is food waste and loss, food loss and waste, which is quite significant in our region. But I think that would also need a bit of uh, long-term policy efforts, particularly on consumer awareness. Last two points. One, I would say that the policy making on the food security in the region could be improved by having much more evidence and data-based policy or a bit more scientific and economic oriented rather than politics oriented. And that I would link a little bit to this repurposing the subsidies or let's say having this fiscal pressures that the governments are having uh, in, in terms of the food security. Now, we, we totally understand the political sensitivities when it comes to some of the subsidies, for example, given to the bread prices, understandable. I mean, this is one issue that is very difficult to touch upon. But are we really efficient in all of the fiscal support to our agriculture sectors? Uh, that is a question that we have to ask. For example, after this recent crisis, you know, many of the countries have started and maybe probably Ambassador Diab can also enlighten us. Even Egypt said to expand, you know, wheat production in a certain area by a certain percentage. Now, as an outsider, we may not know all of the information, but one may ask that if Egypt is earning $6 billion plus from the horticulture, would that be more profitable from an economic perspective or having the wheat that would be more uh, you know, profitable because one is the political decision or let's say this stuff and other is economic. So we have to find a balance or a trade-off between the economy and politics as much as possible. As I said, we cannot uh, ignore the political realities, particularly in our region, uh, which are very, very sensitive. So repurposing subsidies, I would say, is the last point that I would like to leave for the discussion. And we have to think where are we spending? I mean, fine, adjusting this uh, global market prices uh, and not passing it on to the consumers is a good strategy, but that is a short-term strategy once again. Should we not have a mechanism that we can start using these cushions uh, or these you know, balloons that are getting uh, smaller and smaller gradually rather than you know, having the burst of balloon once and then pass it on to the consumers? Um, at, at, uh, in a very, very, let's say, hard manner. So I'll stop here because these were just points I wanted to discuss because I know that we are just 15, 20 minutes away, but probably during discussions we can cover. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmad, uh, for these interesting points and uh, your reflections on, on possible solutions to, to address those vulnerabilities. Our last panelist today is Mr. Kibrom Abey. He is country program leader and research fellow in the development strategy and governance division at International Food Policy Research Institute based in Cairo. Today, he will also share with us his views on the topic. Please, Mr. Abey, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for all the speakers um, who have said really the, the ground for, uh, for, for, for the discussion. Um, 
Jacob had um, comprehensively described it, um, um, uh, the, 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 the landscape of trade um, and its implication on vulnerability uh, to sharks. Um, so I, I don't have much to add, but I just want to add one piece of information um, related to what vulnerability to trade sharks means um, in actual example. Um, and then I'll, I'll provide a bit of policy options, um, uh, some of them related to what had been already covered. Um, so let's let's take the, the Russian-Ukraine crisis, which has disrupted um, with trade. Um, and let's, let's see an example. Let's see this as an example to see the cost of um, diversification or the cost of um, vulnerability to trade. And here we I brought um, um, uh, a, a data showing uh, the amount of the quantity of wheat imported in the MENA region, um, a cumulative amount across four years um, and in each month. And you can see that generally, um, the first figure shows that generally trade continued um, um, uh, with, with um, a slight effect. You can see that the 2022 figure uh, up until uh, July is slightly below um, some of the years, but still trade uh, continued um, and countries managed to um, uh, import what they used to import um, by diversifying from different sources. For instance, um, Egypt um, added a few, few other sources um, and um, uh, some other countries added uh, other sources. But what does that mean to the import bill? And you can see that when we see that the cost, the value of import, um, you can see that the cost of import had increased significantly. Um, for instance, uh, compared to last year, it had increased by 50%. Um, and this is one example to understand the cost of, uh, vulner the cost of uh, uh, vulnerability to trade shocks. So you can see that um, um, uh, up until July, um, countries have incurred 50% more um, more cost um, to import wheat compared to um, what had been the case last year and the year before. Um, so this is one example um, uh, to both to show um, the, the, a bit of the res resilience of trade, um, but also um, um, the cost of vulnerability and the cost of relying on very few countries um, and um, the, 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 the implicit implication of diversifying or um, uh, um, uh, um, adding more and more market. So that, that's just one example. Um, let's come back to um, what, what are the policy options to um, reduce vulnerability to threat shocks. And I'm, I'm happy that um, uh, most of these points have been covered. Um, and uh, um, I think um, Jakob covered uh, some of them. And I think the second speaker, Dr. Ahmed covered um, a good example of how to diversify um, uh, food import and export. And one way is to diversify uh, to, to somehow integrate trade within the regions, within the, 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 the neighboring countries um, and exploit the comparative advantage that different countries have uh, got in, in terms of particularly um, um, within Africa and within uh, the, Arab, the Arab world. Um, I think a second point that I would like to highlight and probably something that had not been covered um, is the, the, the need to rethink about consumer policies and the need to adopt policies um, that encourage production of healthy um, and sustainable dates, diets. So if you compare the amount of wheat consumption in the region, um, it, it is about uh, 150 kilo per, per, per person. And that's almost twice of the average, um, the global average of wheat consumption. So, so that what that means is there is a potential to um, uh, somehow diversify wheat consumption. Um, and move uh, from uh, energy dense uh, or calorie um, um, rich uh, uh, diet like um, dominated by wheat to other more diversified and perhaps even healthy, healthy uh, diets. This is important partly because the region has also um, what we call um, um, the double burden of malnutrition where um, it's not only um, uh, under nutrition or it's not only uh, food insecurity, but there is also a significant amount, amount of obesity and overweight, which is uh, closely associated with consumption of um, wheat and wheat products. Of course, um, um, there is a lot of discussion um, by different um, countries um, uh, on, on how to increase uh, local production or domestic production. And I exactly um, um, uh, echo what, what Ahmed said, um, uh, instead of, um, 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 making political decisions based on um, um, 
what is um, what is um, uh, 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 useful in terms of um, um, ensuring food security, but also it's good to also consider um, other considerations, um, particularly um, whether um, these are economically viable, um, sustainable, uh, particularly given that there is um, looming climate change, uh, water scarcity uh, um, that's affecting the region. Um, what to say that is, um, of course, there, there is a possibility for expanding production in some countries, um, but um, some countries may benefit from ensuring sustainable production um, um, rather than expanding more and more uh, production. Let me stop here. Um, and finally, I would like to, to emphasize also what Ahmed said, um, the, 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 the value of research data to inform food security policies in these settings. Um, and that, that's, um, uh, I cannot emphasize that enough. Let me stop here and then, um, yeah, I'm happy to hear um, if there are comments and talks. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Abey, uh, for your points in relation to the cost of vulnerability to trade shocks and possible policy options to address them. They were, very, they were really insightful. Uh, we are almost approaching to the end of our webinar, but I think we can, we can get one question or one more, que like two questions if the time permits. Um, I see that there is, there is one question. Um, I would like to ask it right now. I would like to read it. Um, it says like this, uh, we have heard a lot about import-related vulnerabilities and diversification in this session. Is such import-related vulnerability also shaped by the relationship of a country with the global economy through other channels? Um, so maybe we can start with Jakob uh, to, to address this question. And later on, we can, we can provide the opportunity to our uh, other panelists to, to um, refer to that question as well. So Jakob, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, maybe I just share a few thoughts on uh, on that particular question, and I immediately pass on to the other panelists. I think, yeah. So the focus very much in the current situation is mostly on the supply side, on on imports or food imports, commodity imports. Um, what I what I think is is presumably as e, as 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 important as diversification and um, securing import supplies is is to think about how we finance it. And then I think in that context, the relationship of a country through other channels um, becomes rather important. So for example, with uh, foreign exchange earnings, which are relevant to um, source food imports, we might want to think about um, the somewhat complica complicated situation of some of the NENA countries currently with um, tourism due to COVID-19 still being uh, very much subdued. Um, that has not recovered since COVID-19. The idea that some countries might be highly reliant on a few commodities for exports as well, and um, maybe a, a little bit of a of a of a different thought is that the notion that in some Nina countries, uh, for example, Morocco or Jordan, um, currently high fertilizer prices may actually also, um, you know, sort of like bolster or um, ameliorate some of um, the foreign exchange needs that are that are currently occurring. Um, should I pass on? Uh, yes, sure. Um, is uh, any of our panelists would like to take the floor to, to reflect more on that issue? I may, may have, uh, if you allow me, been, uh, very briefly. Yes, I think sure. uh, in the long term, we have to understand that we cannot, unfortunately, at the regional level, reduce the imports. So we have to manage the imports. That's the point. Now, in managing the imports, there are many aspects. Of course, sustainability in financing the imports is one. But secondly, the solutions, for example, uh, managing the food loss and waste, managing the storage efficiently. I mean, recently we saw that some of the countries in our region were saying that we should have a food storage capacity of 12 or 18 months. Now, I don't think you know that may be, let's say, the efficient solution or response to that but maybe a much more smart solutions towards um, uh, this uh, storage would be probably an important thing. And uh, one last thing is that by deploying the innovation and technology, we still have a margin for improving productivity in many of the countries that we are lacking uh, of, uh, for the time being. Uh, although we have uh, less water resources than others, but there is still a lot of margin for improving productivity. Thank you. Uh, would, would, would another one uh, would like to take the floor? If not, we have another question in the um, chat box so that uh, I, I can go, go, for, go, go for it if, if you are okay. 
so the question is, what role do national food reserves play in regard to food import vulnerability? Um, sorry. What role do national food reserves play in regard to food import vulnerability and mitigating supply shocks? So the floor is open to our panelists. Uh, who would like to go first? I think, I mean, the best would be Mr. Diab <laughs> from a country, you know, who managed very well this shock uh, by, by the reserve. But I would just say, of course, if he wishes to speak, all I would say that, yes, it does provide you uh, some cushion. But as I just mentioned in my previous intervention, this is not the solution. You know, this is not the only solution. We have seen a surge in enhancing the storage or the reserves capacity by some countries. But in the longer term, that would not be sustainable from a financial perspective and even from the produce perspective. I mean, you can't keep wait, wait for 18 months or, you know, some of the other stuff. But I leave it to Mr. Diab or any other participants from the countries if you wish to speak. Yes, Mr. Diab, the floor is yours. I think you are you are you are you are not need you need to okay. Okay. now. Thank you. Am I audible now? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, with respect to the question that I have here, uh, do how do uh, what role do national food reserves play in regard to food import vulnerability, mitigating supply shocks? And I'll give this. I mean. Uh, I'll give you, I'll tell you some, share with you some, some thoughts that we developed after the, uh, I mean, after, after um, the conflict that, that had that, that uh, and the implications of the conflict on our food security and prices. Um, of course, the conflict is an emergency situation that followed an emergency situation, um, and I'm referring here to the pandemic. Um, price um, hikes, um, I mean, uh, supply chain bottlenecks, uh, um, speculative pricing, speculative markets, air, all sorts of disturbances have happened at the same time. Then we had to look at uh, the reserves that we had and the stock that we had. Uh, then we decided that, well, um, in emergency situations, um, this stock, we need to build our stock. And I mean, it's very important to have stock. And it, of course, this, this should be proportionate to the, of course, to the products that we, are, we depend on, uh, the population, prices, and everything. Uh, again, there are a lot of variables that we have to consider. So um, having stocks is very important um, uh, when it comes to food security. Uh, having stocks is very important to import vulnerability. Having stocks is very important to mitigating supply shocks. Um, the important question here is how could we build, I mean, those stocks? And to what extent shall we uh, maintain stocks and have them uh, with us under uh, our, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the governments, of course, uh, 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 control uh, to maybe address and, 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 and face food security challenges. Uh, from that perspective that we um, maybe um, allow me to refer to the discussions that we had recently at the WTO with respect to the net food importing developing country decision and how to help them face uh, food insecurity in emergency situation. Um, uh, the discussions are going on and I believe we will be able to agree some sort of short, medium, and long-term solutions in the context of the Committee on Agriculture regular session, and as well in the special session when it comes to food security. Um, of course, we're going to base ourselves on the idea of having stocks uh, internally to face uh, the problems as they may happen. Thank you. Um, as we are almost at the end of our webinar, uh, I must now close the Q&A session. Uh, I would like to thank you all the participants and all our panelists for their comments, as well as like the questions from, from the chat box. Um, now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Dominic Bourgeon, uh, the, the director of the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva. Uh, Mr. Bourgeon, uh, the floor is yours for, for closing remarks. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Pina. And it has been, I must say, another very, very uh, interesting session. Uh, today, indeed, we have heard about risk and challenges associated uh, with import-related vulnerabilities and their impact on food security. Uh, we also had very clear views shared on and perspective on how to improve resilience to shocks affecting imports. And I would really like to express to express our very sincere gratitude to all the, the speakers we had today for their for their. Uh, 
excellent uh, presentation and uh, an intervention in the way they, they responded to the question as well. Uh, as you would already know, FAO, uh, as part of our work, we assist members in multiple ways by providing evidence-based information. And this came out, the need for such information came out in several discussions today and in depth analysis. Uh, we also assist in terms of capacity development and assistance, and, and we facilitate neutral dialogue away from the negotiating table. In this spirit, uh, FAO Geneva and actually Ahmed, uh, who spoke on the session today, uh, in collaboration with the Market and Trade Division, started this dialogue series back in 2018. And this year, we are pleased uh, that we have been able to, to hold uh, eight sessions on a range of topics, including soaring for uh, fertilizer prices, the role of trade in agriculture system transformation, uh, digital tools for agri-food trade, uh, amongst uh, many. While uh, featuring presentations based on FAO knowledge and analysis on the topics, on the topic in focus, these sessions also provided an opportunity to discuss uh, the potential implications of development in the agriculture and trade and food security nexus and identify ways to address challenges and opportunities. This year, we have also included the topic of fisheries in our uh, series in collaboration with the Fisheries and Aquaculture Division at FAO headquarters with a view to enhance the understanding of the current state of global fisheries and aquaculture and inform members and partners on the existing and emerging FAO knowledge, tools, and technical assistance available in this regard. Moving forward, we plan to cover important subjects uh, such as the implementation of the new WTO agreement on uh, fisheries subsidies, the transformation of aquatic systems, and the promotion of the responsible and sustainable management of aquatic uh, food systems. FAO in Geneva will continue, we are really committed to continue uh, to organize these dialogues in 2023 on the timely topics of agriculture and fisheries trade in collaboration with the market and trade division at headquarters as well as the fisheries and aquaculture division. And uh, of course, we are extremely grateful to our colleagues, uh, Jacob being uh, one of the representatives of the market and trade division. And, um, and we are grateful to them. Uh, we'll be announcing the teams and date of the upcoming meetings in the in, in due course at, in early January. And uh, in concluding, I would like really to, to thank uh, you all and again our colleagues in the market and trade division, as well as in the, the, the fisheries division, and of course my dear colleagues in the FAO office in Geneva for organizing today's event. And I would like also uh, to, to thank you all, the participants, for participating today in the Geneva Agricultural Trade Talks. And I think now it's getting time to wish you all uh, a very uh, happy new year and a good uh, holiday season. Thank you very much and bye-bye.